Hello everyone, I'm Daniel and Pax is with me. We are going to do a little bit of a wrap up of the campaign that we just played, the campaign play along through Return to the Forgotten Age. We talked a little bit about the campaign itself in the end of the last video. So if you don't know what happened, we're not going to tell you that much about the story, but we will talk about how our decks performed and maybe some slight spoilers about how things went in particular scenarios, given the cards that we had in play. But uh, I want to start by looking at our our level zero decks and just sort of talking about the evolution. I'm not going to look at all the, there's like so many scenarios. We won't look at every uh, iteration since then, but what the major idea was and uh, what you felt like you needed to change and fix as we got to the um, the final version. And we'll talk about those here too. And maybe a little bit of commentary about each other's decks. I always like to have the other players say some nice things about each other's decks. What impressed you? Uh, what was something you learned about uh, the investigator because this is the first time either of us played these investigators i played parallel monterey jack and uh, pax you played hank sampson hank sampson that's right all right let's start with you since i've talked a bit and yeah uh, sure i'm going to show on screen the uh level zero hank sampson i think that the big thing that i took away from the level zero deck is that like 35 cards is a much bigger deal than it sounds like. Um, five more cards. You know, I'm a I'm a, a known hater of Versatile. I've <laughs> largely... My experience with Versatile has largely been that it, it has almost always uh, junked my decks. Like, it has made my opening hands worthless, and it has totally killed any momentum the deck might have had with card draw and and set up time. Um, and I think that knowing that and having that in mind, I should have realized, yeah, no, Hank needs more than than, than four weapons and, and a one-two punch. Um, <laughs> and I think that was, yeah, I think that was a bit of a failure on my part to understand, like, the way that push to the limit plays where it, you know you get to throw things back into your deck after you've discarded them but like it's actually you know you still gotta redraw it mm -hmm. and you only get one attack with it from the discard pile and you're not discarding your pitchforks they're just getting attached to locations um so there's like a, a whole bunch of things there that kind of all play together yeah. I think that also... Did you get rid of those uh, Push the Limits eventually? I don't remember seeing them after a while. I got rid of them very fast. Okay. In fact, in Scenario 2, I dropped a long shot and one uh, Push to the Limit for two Derringers. Just to add more like, right weapons away. in. Just to, just to say I have more weapons. Mm -hmm. And I think that <laughs> like like even if I'd had more weapons at the start... Um... Like, say that I had six weapons. I still think that I would have liked to have spent my first four XP on two backpack level twos. And I'm really kicking myself at how long it took me to add those <laughs> into the deck. Because they just search so deep. It's nuts. In case you are new to this series, uh, one reason why these decks are a little funky in some respects is that we're playing with a campaign play-along uh, card pool, which means we are only using cards from the revised core, uh, the Forgotten Age, Return to the Forgotten Age, the Investigator starter deck, so uh, any of you know Jacqueline, Stella Clark, etc., as well as the uh, Feast of Hemlock Vale. Uh, at this point, it was just the um, the previewed cards, the officially previewed cards. So, That's right. When we started, it was just the officially previewed cards, and I don't think that we ever. I have one. You have one, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because it did take us a little while to play this campaign. Yes. Yes. We we did only play once a week. And one That's one right. week we played two scenarios, I think. Yeah. But That's right. Yeah. Like another question to to ask for discussion is: Do you think you would have changed anything here, um, in the level zero deck, with the expanded card pool in mind? Kind of what you based on what you learned about Hank. Yeah. Um. Definitely. I'm pretty sure that. And I'm just going to pop up some level zero survivor cards um, up here in the corner for my for my own my own purposes. Sure. Um, resourceful is is like clearly missing, right? Like mm -hmm. um, you get to help out a lot more on clues if you can resourceful back and look what I found. 
Like that's just it's just a really strong play. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that you know with this two pit two baseball bat two pitchfork, I would have been perfectly happy to have two sledgehammer alongside that. Um, that would have been my sixth weapon. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? My fifth and sixth weapon. Yeah. Um, pretty easily. Um, and then also in the larger card pool, there's also some like obvious ally swaps like stray cat is really just there for snake bite protection like mm-hmm. you need some redundancy on allies for snake bite you're not passing that as hank right now um mysterious raven didn't even actually do that so uh you know my my go-to ally in, in level zero tends to be madame labranche and i i think she would have been really good here um would you have gone towards a, a more uh fire axe build or or no um i don't know uh i I really like i really wanted to play pitchfork because my when i read that card i was like this is just not very good it doesn't give you a bonus to hit and it is slow you have (laughs) to pick it up Mm -hmm. i've never been a fan of the ornate bow um after like a really disastrous playthrough of the egypt scenarios with the 19 xp skids <laughs> at, a, at an invocation kit okay okay um it just you know it fell flat in its face in such a pathetic way that i was just always like well that's that's really inconvenient to take an action to be able to fight again so i just wasn't convinced on pitchfork and this totally has me convinced on pitchfork like it's perfectly fine um when you <laughs> when you've got a five combat that turns to six without even needing to play like a jessica hyde or or a beat cop or whatever um the, the plus one's perfectly fine. And when you're dealing three damage in one hit, it doesn't really matter if you need to pick it up later. You, 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 it's not that hard to find the time to pick it up. And if, if you don't have the time to pick it up, you just play your next weapon. That's right. Um, you, you'll have time to pick it up enough times that eventually when you do need to leave it behind, you, you'll be able to overwrite it with something that's either more reliable or whatever. And three health um, in this campaign is super important. Three health in this campaign is super important. In fact, I specifically wanted to take it in this campaign because of that. And like, I wanted to see what happens when you can one shot a brotherhood cultist. And that just never happened. (laughs) We didn't draw them. (laughs) I don't think we, did we ever see one? We did. I think in boundary beyond maybe, but I don't think we ever saw them in, uh, threads of fate or in the, uh, shattered eons scenario. Yeah. No, that's absolutely, that's absolutely weird. (laughs) So weird. So, so that's kind of the hand slot ally aspect. Mm-hmm. I think that if I had somehow found a room for a second Sparrow Mask, that would have been a lot stronger. Like, it's a very good card, and I think one of in a thirty-five card deck is a bit, a bit over eager. Mm-hmm. Like that's 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 trying to get away with something that it probably shouldn't try to get away with. Um. Look what I found, glory, live and learn, uh, and stand together, I think are pretty well exactly cards that I need. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Ward of Protection would have made more sense in a full card pool where you can upgrade it to the upgraded one. That's true. You can take the level two version. That's right. Um, Perseverance is really cool, but I think where of a deck eventually went into baseball bats... Uh, not baseball bats excuse me backpacks that perseverance would be better as like a talisman of protection yeah um canceling like you know what i mean like canceling four damage is not really worth not being able to like fetch it out really quickly and having a bit more item density um not that i really needed it like it either hit two or three every time Mm -hmm. with as few items as i have um but still I, i think that's like an easy consideration at the very least all right, um, you had one copy of Wrong Place, Right Time. Did you ever find the right time to play this card? No, no, we never found the right time. Not with one copy. I bet with, I, I think with two copies, maybe it's possible. Um, But I was a little, I guess, you know, I, it feels unfair to say I was unimpressed with the card because like, it, it was really good icons. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we saw. But I don't have a lot of card draw. So like really good icons only goes so far, yep. right? Um. And it's technically, it's supposed to be card draw, but 
I think the deck really just wasn't well suited to it. And that might have been like wrong place, right time is a single wild and a single agility would have been better to have uh, a second Sparrow mask so that I can get a whole bunch more to to uh, willpower to agility. Probably. Probably. <laughs> All right. You didn't um, see it in this deck uh, list here at level zero, but your random basic weakness was um, 13th vision along yes. with uh, Where's Pot. And uh, it didn't, I don't think it bothered you too much. I think 13 no, vision I is think annoying. Kind but... of, Hank just like tests high on the thing that he likes to do actively, anyways. So exactly. Like, yeah. It's not the same as when someone's like kind of good at everything and pushes each of their stats up a little bit. And then it's like, oh, shit. Now I have to. Now I, I was beating, you know, I was beating the minus twos and, and better. And now I'm actually only beating the minus ones. Crap, right? <laughs> um, I will say that I was really impressed with Stout Hearted. Like this, this the, the experience of playing Hank, I think, was a lot cooler than I was expecting it to be. Um, I know a lot of people aren't too hot on his damage and horror assignment thing, but like I, I thought it was just really engaging and interesting of trying to figure out when it would be the most advantageous for me to take one on the chin for you so that you don't get put in a bad spot later without without putting myself in a bad spot later, right? Yeah, and just sort of to talk about the Resolute thing, you um, often figured out how to get the right amount of damage on you, either from me or from your own abilities, and go resolute by healing everything equally. So that That's was right. that was pretty impressive the way that you kind of finagled that towards the end. I think you that was a little bit of a learning process too when you realized that uh, using Vita Witsley could put damage or horror on you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm really interested to to explore that aspect of him a bit more, like pairing him up, like like for instance, um, pairing him up with. Uh, oh gosh, uh, oh my god, I'm my 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 brain has just turned into mush. Um, pair, pairing him up with like a like a Joe Diamond or something, ooh. and then Joe Diamond has like field agents, and it's like all right. I'm going to take this horror to so that you can keep getting more clues out of these field agents. That's right? so funny. Or beat cops. Or beat cops, exactly, right? Like something like that where it's like, okay, I'm I'm just going to absorb this while you get a whole bunch of free stuff done, and then that'll put me resolute, and then, you know, once I'm resolute, then I'll be a bit more careful about it, right? I, I think it's going to be interesting to explore. I felt, because I didn't know how it was going to go, I was a lot more cautious with going resolute really quickly i think in a but also bigger card pool you can afford to be uh resolute more often because you probably have more soak that's right yes and that is one thing i guess that maybe you know if if, if we're looking at my my initial deck list versus my final deck list it's got two granny or two mysterious raven and two stray cat well like that's actually not that much soak like granny orn is a decent amount of sanity but she's expensive mm-hmm uh, and the mysterious raven is actually dealing me horror if I'm using it, <laughs> right? And so when you look at the final deck list, like even then, the Granny Orn upgrade doesn't have more soak. She just has that lucky, which helps you kind of pass a few more treacheries. Mm -hmm. And Aquana deals horror to herself and doesn't cancel the horror that's coming in from the attack. And then Vita Witsley deals herself damage or horror which you can assign to yourself so like it it looks like there's a lot of sanity soak amongst these guys but there's like if you look at it i've only got what five health or seven health printed across all these all all five of them mm -hmm. and then there's nothing else in the deck um and i think that with the full card pool you might like i said madame lebranche is like a really cheap easy ally to give you two two and or resources and cards if you're running low and there's just so much that can be done with the full card pool um so i'm looking at the uh final deck list on on screen now and obviously 64 experience goes a long way so you replaced the baseball bats because they were underperforming they were, <laughs> they were underperforming i was pulling the skulls way too often with them 
Um, yep. And it just, I, it's funny, like baseball bats never a card that I've been in love with, but I, I don't think I've ever had it screw me so, so singularly as it did here. Uh, so the old that hunting might rifle. Be, yeah, go ahead. That might be because I've only really ever played it in York in the past where he can get it back so easy. Yeah, it doesn't matter so much if it discards. Without uh, resourceful right. scrounge for supplies, it is a lot worse. That's right, yeah. Um, so yeah, like you said, that got replaced with the old hunting rifle, which, I mean, at the start, seemed like it wasn't a whole lot better. <laughs> you know, we, we I started off the first scenario I had it, I think I jam it jammed two out of the seven shots I did. Yeah, that's not good. Um, but as, it, as we went on... The U catastrophe and the strong armed really showed that, like, no, this is this this has legs, right? Like, you're 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 dishing out damage with this. Um, maybe it is jamming, but at least you're dishing out damage while it's jamming. And it's cheap. Um, it's real cheap. Yeah, and it's cheap. It, you know, three three resources for nine damage is even if you're having to do a bit of combos, it is it is a lot of damage that you can push out, uh, at least in two player, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you got the Derringers, um, which are just always solid weapons. They're, the level 2 version is just amazing, right? Yeah, the level 2 version, I guess, kind of... The level 2 version, to me, is is a really strong weapon, right? Like, 2 cost for 6 damage that, like, can't not be dealt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so long as you'll ever hit. Um, and when you compare that to the level 1 version, like, there's, there's a good reason I didn't have the level 1 version in this deck. Uh... I, I I genuinely don't think it's a particularly good uh, card. It it costs one extra. It's only dueling four damage. Like one play action and two shots is four damage. It's like three actions and three resources to do four damage is just like really rough. Um. And like yeah, it's guaranteed damage, but it's just so expensive. <laughs> like, can you imagine if? I guess, like, compare it to the baseball bat that broke after swinging it twice, right? That's not helping me any more than that baseball bat was. Yeah, um, that's true. And from a redundancy standpoint, maybe that would have made sense. But I just, I don't know. I just, I just don't, I don't care for the Derringer level zero. I don't think it does enough for a single card slot. Whereas Derringer level two is just, it's just a lot. Um, I will say, towards the beginning, through the middle of the campaign, actually even towards the end, you had... An absurd amount of money. That's right. That paying, you know, three resources for the two shots is not terrible, even though the card was, of course, going to be upgraded by then. But uh, something that impressed me about Hank, or that I would never have considered, is he's rich. Yeah, if you go... And I think that this was also a, an aspect of the deck. Like, um, early on, the, the, the card cost curve for the level zero deck... It, I had two three cost cards, two four cost cards, and everything else was two or one, or zero. Yep, yep. Um, which means that like between upkeep and stand together and take heart, you know, you, you've you've got enough money to play all those things. And then when you start adding the warden in as well, it's like, oh my god, this is I'm swimming in cash. Yep. The the final deck has five four cost cards four three cost cards and then uh 10 two cost six one cost and six zero cost so like i lose a lot of one cost cards for a bunch of three and four cost cards and a couple of my skills for them as well um all that kind of plays together into a deck that's a little more expensive and also i just didn't really go resolute as early i don't think like in shattered aeons no when yeah. did i go resolute right when we were killing them yeah i think it was right towards the end yeah. yeah, and then obviously in City of Archives I didn't. Um, and then in Depths of Yoth we just... Well, know, you'll we see. We <laughs> that in a really weird way. <laughs> we, we just got super lucky on all of our explorers and never got mixed up or anything. It, there, there was a, that was a weird scenario. It was That's, very weird. Yeah. Anyways, the point being, if, if you go Warden Hank... You know, you can rely on being able to pay for pay for stuff. And so and so maybe the, the, the point 18 Derringer would have been fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I like being able to afford, to see that you can afford things like Aquina and it not being that big of a deal. So it, it puts more, uh, it, it's almost like a, an extra action, kind of like your counterpunch, being able to deal damage back during the enemy phase or 
by taking a play action or something. That's right. Um, I like Aquina a lot, and I've used her in Daniela, mm -hmm. and she's like she's stellar in Daniela. Um, but I I think she's just a really good card. At least the level the level three one, the, the level one one is it's kind of too narrow to yeah. yeah. Needing to have two enemies is is just too narrow. But but the level three version of of just being able to like I, you know we didn't get to do it uh, against Yig ever in the campaign, but like uh, reflecting Yig's attack back at him for three damage is hilarious. <laughs> um, and then so yeah, going through the rest of the upgrades, yeah, the counter punch is really good. It would have been really good to have a second counter punch. I think um, I'm pretty sure a second counter punch would have gone a long way. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 maybe in a wider card pool, I guess I guess a big thing is that like. Quite a few of my decisions on card upgrades were informed by being quite scared of City of Archives on, on, on in the limited card pool. And with a wider card pool, you just get to choose things that have, like, you know, there's redundancy in there where you can just choose things with different icons that are, that are, that are, that are better. Um, you know, part of the conceit of City of Archives is that, hey, you, you need to... <laughs> Have a couple of assets that are really strong, and then have a whole bunch of your events and skills be high icon count so that you can make those strong assets work. Yeah. Um, yeah, because the pitchfork in City of Archives was, like, not good. No. Three combat is bad. And I'm pretty sure in City of Archives, we I really didn't have much in the way of combat icons. I mean, if you look at this deck, it really doesn't have that many combat icons compared to the rest. Are there any cards that have double combat once I dropped the overpower? Stouthearted. I'm never playing that for the icons. No. <laughs> um, I don't I don't remember if I had my lucky threes by then. I don't so think they're, so. They're think... kind of like icons, like they're like hidden icons, but they're not really, like, you know, it's not a plus six. No. Right? Um... So yeah, no, the, the deck just, just doesn't have many double icons, and in the wider card pool, you'd be able to pick up stuff like Oops, level two, mm -hmm. and you know, get your second counter punch maybe, or maybe maybe toss in your brute forces into the deck so that you can commit them for a plus six attack in City of Archives, right? Right. Like, yeah, without stuff just like a hide that. or brute force, that it was a lot tougher. I mean, I, we we got through it, but. It was definitely a lot tougher, I think, with the limited card pool. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's that's just true. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even uh, with 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 the full card pool, it might have been interesting to just upgrade my baseball bat instead of pick up the old hunting rifle, so that my strong arms could have been, mm. you know, protecting against protecting against that breakage while also being able to dish out bonus damage. Right. You know, that's the thing is, I don't think, I don't remember if you ever used strong armed on one of the melee weapons. I think you just used it for the auto fail protection, which did, yeah, did work. That's right. Uh, and yeah, no, it did work. Um, strong armed is a card that I'm really, you know, for one XP, <laughs> you get an awful lot of card. You do. Um, the fact that it doesn't have to be committed to a melee or ranged asset attack, uh, is just really, is just really good. Yeah, this card scares me a little with the whole card pool where you can recur it with, you know, say, Silas or True Survivor or something. But here it was just, it seemed pretty fair. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's that's reasonable. Um, that's definitely reasonable. Um, I think one thing, though, that I don't know if I'll ever play a Hank deck without is a single Five of Pentacles. Ooh. Plus one health, plus one sanity just goes a long way when you're looking at a character that can be an 11-9 or a 9-11. Mm -hmm. To make them a 12-10 or a 10-12 is, like, a big deal. It's nice to see the card has a home outside of Calvin. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, to be honest with you, I'm pretty sure... I'm, I think it's a pretty good card, all things considered. It's just, you know, not many people leverage, you know the plus one health and plus one sanity in the same way that Calvin and Hank do. Mm -hmm. Like, it's great. Um, so many characters don't mind taking a few hits on the chin. Like, survivors are just really good at that. And getting one extra to be able to do that with is is pretty good. It's just not 
typically worth three resources if you don't get it in your opening hand. Exactly. Right? And um, up in the card slot is a tough ask, too. Yeah. But maybe not but Hank I think either. In Hank, right? it's, a, it's a pretty easy ask. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, I missed what you said there. No, no, I just said, in, except for in Hank, it seems like with 35 cards, uh, hard to get it in your opening hand, but still maybe worth uh, two copies. That's right. Um, I guess the only thing that's on the top of my head right now is that we have a bit of an asterisk with a <laughs> few of our scenarios because we missed that the Elder Sign effect on Hank, once you've gone Resolute, is mandatory. It does not say you may move one horror from Hank uh, Simpson to an asset you control, or you may move one damage from Hank to an asset you control. It just says move one damage. So I think that in the larger card pool, you're definitely, if you want to be doing a flexible thing where like you're trying to figure out which way you go, you really need to have some cards in your deck that have both pools. And you need to be a little careful not to load them up too much. And I think one of the big ones to really get away with that is Precious Memento. Yes. Because it has 3-3. Three, three. It goes in your accessory slot, which I didn't even use except for a cherished keepsake in this camp, whole campaign. Um, and it can heal itself. So if you're moving the damage or horror, whichever you prefer, um, it, you can heal it off. And... You know, if you are the Warden, you can very reliably succeed at a test to heal one or fail at a test to heal the other with your one intellect and six fight. <laughs> um, as the assistant, maybe it's a bit trickier to be to be failing a test by two or more, but either way, I think that's a really good option for it. Um, I'm really sad that I didn't play Devil, I gotta say. Oh, you're right. I forgot about that. How come you didn't get that into your deck? Uh, just never really came up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, it was it was more just like I it, it always seemed like there was something a little more pressing that needed to go in. Um, that's fair. As much as it could have helped with damage output and uh like kind of healing back my health while I was resolute. Mm -hmm. It seemed like I needed the horror soak a bit more. Like horror was, you know, it's the, it's the thing, right? Where like I'm a, a, a one scenario I was in eleven four, right? So I really need a bunch of horror soak. <laughs> um, yeah, I will say that I'm kind of glad that my first time trying Hank, I didn't just go for Peter Sylvester and Jessica as my two allies. It's a little boring right i don't know if it's see like i don't even want to call it boring it just seems like it could be a really samey play pattern like and, and that's this is just me getting around saying the word boring um it just it just I, i've already played peter sylvester right. and jessica in survivors every survivor you can it's it's pretty good yeah i know they're, they're a great team mm -hmm. um but I just was kind of like, let's just let's just do something else with them, see if it works. And it works. Yeah, it works. Absolutely. All right. Let me uh, also just sort of say one thing that's not in your final deck uh, anymore was the live and learn. And I, I played Survivor a decent amount, but the number of times that I watched you kind of aggressively use live and learn was kind of eye-opening to me. That's just not a play pattern that I've really done myself or, or seen much of where you basically intend to fail and you then use live and learn to just take the test again with the plus two and then you commit when i played this card before usually it's a auto fail protection and otherwise i'm trying to pass the test but um worked pretty well i'm, I'm impressed by that yeah um i find that like it's pretty acceptable to do it either way but i like where it's like if i've got more cards in hand than i really know what to do with and and I was taking a lot of draw and resource actions this campaign. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I had a bunch of cards that I didn't like. You know, I've got two perseverances and my wrong place, right time, and no weapons. I'm going to keep taking draw actions, right? Um, sometimes you just get a bunch of cards, and you're like, well, I can just brute force this test, right? 
if I'm not testing high enough, I'll just I'll just go at it with this live and learn, get the plus two and commit on the second one. Um, it is a really it does it does feel like you're missing out on that kind of auto fail protection aspect of it, but sometimes sometimes the 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 the, the game state is like okay, we need to keep things moving forward, so mm -hmm. let's just use this to keep it moving forward. So I'm the kind of player that really does just I mean I guess you probably figured it out, especially with the build that I'll talk about in a second, but I don't move particularly quickly. I I. I I think you told me a number of times throughout the campaign, it's looking at the, the Doom Clock saying, we better pick up the pace. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> you weren't wrong, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that the way that you played the card and played Hank in general kind of speaks to uh, maybe a little more aggressive play than, than I'm, I'm used to. Yeah, no, fair enough. Okay. Um... Any any other last words about Hank before we move on to? I did take a look just in this conversation. I haven't looked a lot at like the innate and spirit non survivor stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that playing him again, I'd really like to try out true understanding in him as a clue card. Yeah, especially in this campaign. Um. Or any recent ones, honestly. There's a lot of... I mean, you could pass anything but an intellect test if you really wanted to. That's just it, right? Like, like that can be made to just be free clues, basically. Um, but I don't think it would have made... It, it was available to me in this one, wasn't it? Yeah, it, that's from Boundary was. Beyond. Yep. Um, but I, I think that in this deck, it doesn't quite... It didn't wouldn't have quite made sense. But... There's certainly a Hank deck where I think it could make sense, uh, and I'd be interested to see that. It's a fun card. Um, yeah. I also sure. could have taken it, and I didn't. <laughs> um, another, like, really hilariously funny one is uh, just as, like, a, a final call-out of, like, a card that would be interesting to take in, uh, in Hank in the future mm -hmm. is Savant. Yeah. Uh, if you become... Assistant Hank with Granny Orn in play, your Savant is giving you plus five to any skill. Yeah, because you're four four you're five four, five four. four 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 four. Is that what you are? Four. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. So I mean, you know, is it good? Eh, eh. But it could be really interesting to try. And also, like, you know, if you're if you're a normal Hank here and you and you just toss it into an into an investigate or an intellect check, it's giving you it's it's putting you at five intellect for that test, right? Yeah, you do that for your. Uh, what's the one where you drop clues? Not hunting shadow, but the other one. False lead. False lead. Yeah. Yeah, false lead is. That's that. That's one of those. Basically, any of the six, uh, fail by intellect treacheries. If if those are showing up much in the campaign, you might want to consider something like savant. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, I think I did a pretty good job of dodging those or just not holding on to my clues for too long. Yeah, definitely. Well, it was, it was good. I, I enjoyed Hank. I mean, he, he was the muscle. I, I would love to see a, an, a full assistant run or something. I think it would be interesting with the full card pool, but it made sense to do what you did here. And it was yep. sure good. Yeah. Let's go ahead and take a look at Monterey Jack. And this is going to be uh, first, looking at the level zero version on your screen, the wolf mask here is, of course, Fox Mask. It was not on Arkham DB at the time. Um, again, this is the first time I ever played him. He's got the front side, which makes you want to have lots of relics and charms in your deck because you get to um, play one after you discover the last cl uh, clue at a location. You search the top X cards and play a charm or relic, reducing its cost by X, and then that's good. It didn't always happen. Um, I don't think I had a whole lot of um, relics in the card pool that made sense to me that I really wanted to play. Uh, so at the beginning, I just have the two copies of Scrying Mirror, a Disc of Itzamna, two Holy Rosaries, and the two uh, Fox Masks. That was it. I don't think I increased that number by a huge amount later, but I think I did. That was one thing to do because that was sort of the reason to play Monterey Jack. 
and then uh, I threw in this side thing of playing parlay. Why? Because that was the card pool. <laughs> <laughs> Did it really make sense? I don't know, but it was fun. I mean, <laughs> it functioned. It did. Uh, unfortunately, I got the devil as my random basic weakness, which <laughs> kind of makes the front side of his card blank until you can play that, but it actually just wrecked my mulligans. That was mostly what it did, and it gave me starting hands of four with uh, two resources. Card sucks, man. Yeah, that... Uh, I... <laughs> Personally, I think the devil is like one of the worst basic weaknesses you can get. I know a lot of people have said that like, oh yeah, but the tower costs one more. I'm like, sure, but like, who doesn't need to play assets? Especially at the beginning of the game. At, especially at the beginning of the game. And, you know, the tower doesn't cost you the skills from your hand to play it. It costs you money. But the devil costs you money that you need to play your assets with. <laughs> it's true. Right? Like, playing tower, it's like, cool, I've played it for four, now I can commit my skills. Playing the devil is like, cool, I've played it for three. I can't fucking afford anything. <laughs> I know. That that happened. I had uh, a few scenarios where I played the devil and then got two or three resources after that, I guess. Too. Right. Yeah. Awful. And, and, you know, that's kind of a, kind of a, a, a grift thing. Right, mm -hmm. where your economy card was Grift and and Milan, and the, like. Sure, Milan gets you one a turn, and Grift only works when there's enemies out. Yeah, that that was one thing about that, learning about the parlay stuff and Alessandra and whatnot. You you really do need the enemies out, and it wasn't a problem sometimes. But when they're not there, and you're like, I wish I could just play these cards so I can do something. It's uh, it's a little painful. So looking at the level zero deck, the things that I got rid of. I don't even remember playing the trench coat. Maybe I did at one point, but it's gone. Uh, the pilfer, I don't think I ever played. It was there just in case I didn't draw um, other things to get clues. The nimble I got rid of somewhat quickly. And I think everything else stayed until the very end. I got rid of eavesdrop. Oh, you handled this one went away fairly quickly too. I just had better events to put in the deck. Uh, eavesdrop I like a lot. I think this is a card that people look at and say this is not good enough 100% of the time, right? If I want my cards to always do something, it kind of runs into the same problem as the parlay stuff, but I think you can make it work and it's very cheap. There's a lot of one of eight enemies in this campaign. Or two. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think that eavesdrop kind of there, there were a lot of cards, even in this level zero deck, that, that really took me aback throughout the <laughs> campaign. Um, is Persuasion the other one? Eavesdrop or... is one, and Persuasion is one. And maybe the level zero lockpicks, which we can come back to in a second. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Persuasion made it to the end. Uh... <laughs> Now, is that a matter of you needed to have a minimum number of tricks in your deck? <laughs> Par parlay cards, I think, in general. So the whole, yeah, no, whole that's, that's right. The whole angle here was certainly to get Grift, and I wanted to see, or sorry, uh, Snitch, and I wanted to see if that could do anything. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about Persuasion again. But the level zero lockpicks also survived until I just had so much XP, there didn't really need to be any reason to uh, upgrade them until then. I think I lost them once. I I don't even remember you losing them once, to be honest with you. You might have, but it, like if you did, it wasn't impactful. No, it wasn't. Like you like like you didn't need them anymore because you had Milan and uh, Lola. Oh my gosh, Lola out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Lockpicks is a card that I've generally just like totally written off. Lockpicks level zero. I don't think I've ever played it not immediately auto-failed or drawn a negative modifier that instantly destroyed them. Um, so it was really interesting to see. But I've also not played the normal Monterey Jack. Um, something about 
his deck building is just like really uninspiring to me. And I just, I've, been, I've never landed on like a level zero deck that I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll play that and I'll, I'll play it with this character, right. Mm-hmm. As a, as my, as my parent, um, that's never happened. So like getting to nine with the lock picks without even putting any effort into it is just, it's just a lot. It is. There were like minus fives that didn't phase me after a while. Well, yeah, and like really the only thing that breaks it is the minus five and the auto fail. Mm-hmm. Even early, but like you just you just never drew it on those. And I think the next the next card that really blew me away, which like I knew I, I know it's a good card. It's just one that you can never really afford to fit into a deck is Scrying Mirror. Yeah, this was um, fun, right? I yeah, mean, like A was, if you're getting it for free. It's really good. But even just seeing it play was kind of neat. That's right. Um, the only time I'd ever played this before was in, like, the time that I played the starter decks unedited mm-hmm. Jacqueline. Through, through campaigns. To be like, are these function? I just wanted to test that they were functional, right? And I played Scrying Mirror and Jacqueline, and it was it was, it was was fine. It was, it was actually pretty good, uh, despite how little economy that Jacqueline deck has. Um, it was still okay. Um, but here, it was insane. <laughs> Even for the times that I drew the auto fail with it, which were a number of times, like maybe yeah. three or four well, or more. It just let you know not to put anything else into it. Like it was a test that you you might have put your fox mask charge into and you just got to hold on to it. Yep. Or you might have committed a card from hand and you just sort of like, well, no, no, no. I'm not going to bother committing until I see what the token is. Oh, look, it's a zero. I don't have to commit anything. Yeah. Oh look, it's an auto fail. I don't have to commit anything. Yeah, it's 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 fun. I like it. Uh, um, the Holy Rosary was kind of a strange ad. Like, why do I do this in a one uh, willpower investigator? But actually, kept one of them to the end for just the sanity. One thing that you'll right. you'll see from this deck is that Monterey Jacks, at least this Monterey Jacks, uh, numbers went to the moon. Yes, that's right. You you were consistently at like seven intellect and seven agility or something. Yeah, and then like two or three in the other stats. Yeah, um, really cool seeing that kind of like stat ball thing happen. Like stat ball stats across the board isn't something I do very often. Um, usually it's just like boosting my active stat and mm-hmm. like maybe a side stat through like Granny Warren. Or, or Gret, or something like that. But, like, seeing the whole thing pushed up so high, like, you were just so flexible in what you could do. You'd pass some treacheries here and again with zeros. Yep. Um, the willpower just, ones, yeah. yeah. No, just super cool. That was fun. All right, let's um, take a look at the uh, level whatever deck this is. 63 experience. <laughs> oh. So I have not exactly the same number as you for a couple of reasons, and we'll start with the, the, the big one. Um... The trusty bullwhip, the advanced version here, uh, I had to basically pay four XP for, so I had to spend extra XP in, to get to the scenario relics of the past, the uh, Jack's side scenario to upgrade the the bullwhip, and then you got more XP out of that. But I got the bullwhip, and this the, this card is so crazy. <laughs> if you got four less experience to upgrade this bullwhip, basically, yep, like. If you told me, hey, this is four experience better than the previous bullwhip, I would say yes. It yep. sure is. <laughs> it is at least four XP better. At least. Okay. Uh, Just the thing where you can get plus two skill value over the the original one is is nutty, but then you do the extra damage and automatically evade once per uh, round on the exhaust did an incredible amount of work. Yeah, that was that card is it, it's just really good. I felt a little guilty having this in my deck because of how much I could actually deal with the enemies. But you know what? The way that you dealt with the enemies was like delaying a bit, right? Um, Between the bullwhip and the persuasion, you weren't like just deleting enemies constantly. Yes. You were just like, oh, did we draw two enemies too many times in a row? All right, let me evade one. Let me shove one away right that's right it's not the same as it's not the same as when people are like oh yeah my no my seeker took the ancient stones that deals damage when he draws and i never shot my lightning gun 
<laughs> That's it's a totally true. it's a totally different thing. You're right. I, I did uh basically every time we drew a couple enemies um or had some on the board, we just neither of us were afraid like we couldn't execute our game plan. And that that was nice to see compared to like playing I know a lot of people play a uh, straight up cleaver who basically never deals with enemies and then you know the the fighter does all the work and then the problem is what happens if there's uh, enemies that are too there's too many of them or um the fighter can't get a weapon out or, or whatever but we just didn't have that problem with the monterey jack deck to deal with enemies that's right and i think the base i mean the base five agility goes a long way for it that it really does but yeah. you know also the lola santiago plus one the trusty bullwhip plus two the plus one from a crystalline elder sign like you're just you're, you're testing it's such a huge value it was crazy <laughs> it was really crazy so um beyond the bullwhip which i did pr probably play every time I, I played monterey jack the, the base version before in like a three-player game and i never really used the bullwhip because i didn't need to but i'm impressed with the base version and this is just turning it up to 11. yeah no it's it's it's, it's really it's a really strong card Okay, the Lucky Cigarette Cases, everyone knows that this is a great card. I probably should have got the second one a little bit earlier than I did, but it's a charm, so playing it for free did happen. And it just draws so many cards, man. It's it's passive draw is hard to come by in other classes, I think. That's right. Other than yeah. Seeker. I think, I mean, I think the reason that you hesitated was because you can only get so many Relic Hunters, right? It's true. And it's like you don't want to, you don't want to pull a lucky cigarette case when you've got a holy rosary that you need to get one more soak out of, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's right. I did get two relic hunters eventually, and I could have done the occult reliquary for the Christian elder sign because that's blessed, but I didn't really need to do that. Um, well, at this point, at this point, you've got so many. I don't know. Like this, this deck is so jam packed. It is. It's it's crazy. Um, Leo De Luca, great ally as usual. Doctor yeah. Milan, Lola. I, I, I don't think you can go wrong in like ninety percent of rogues with those, those allies. Yeah, and if it's not Doctor Milan, it's you know, if you're a if you're a fighter, your rogue, it's a Delilah, or it's right. a it's a Gregory Gry to get loads of cash off of, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Fox mask I liked. Um, all right, we can talk about the oh a couple other relics that are I put in. I guess the grotesque statue I didn't see towards the end. I think I only saw it in the last scenario. Uh, Shattered uh, yeah, you saw you saw it in the second to last scenario. Right? Yeah, the uh, Shattered Aeons. Yep, and uh, it was. Uh, I mean, it works right. It, like it, it's good. I wish I it were cursed so I could have had an extra hand slot for it. But I was really concerned about the hand slots because I didn't want to dump the whip it was obvious that that was always going to be one of my hand slots yeah no that's fair that's fair mm -hmm. and that that was probably correct <laughs> uh even the lockpicks i didn't play towards the end because i had the a mirror or a statue out and i i did play it but usually it felt like i didn't <laughs> need to get a single I mean, clue. once your base intellect is seven right <laughs> do, you, do you need it to be 14 no <laughs> maybe for right. your lucky cigarette cases but otherwise yeah but like yeah but also because you're playing so many relics there's a, there's a really funny thing that happened that that seemed to happen pretty consistently with the deck is like <laughs> between your cards in hand your assets in play you were you were reshuffling fairly often mm-hmm and whenever you reshuffled, you would hit a big lucky cigarette and search like almost your entire deck. He was crazy for, the, for whatever your best card is. Exactly. And it was just like, like, look at the top nine, and you're like, okay, what card do yeah. I want right now? Yeah. Which which card did I just shuffle away that I need back? So here's the events. So at the end of the the campaign, I added in these backstabs, which uh, I don't want to spoil what happened with them, but it they're they're really funny cards. <laughs> yeah. The back, I mean, the backstab was there because there's big enemies, yep. right? Right towards the end, there's a bunch of big enemies that you have to kill. And we thought, yeah, maybe the bullwhip is not quite enough to support Hank in killing them. Right, and I had the money to, to play them, so I, I wasn't too concerned. Yep. Uh, 
So that brings, I had lots of money getting cards. The hot streaks, the paydays came in, which I think were, are perfectly fine. Uh, Monterey Jack can't take the level four hot streak, which is a little sad, but in a full card pool, I probably wouldn't need them. Probably there's other things that you can put in the deck that get money better, like uh, maybe an unscrupulous loan would be a better shot. Oh yeah, I know with how with how much you were consistently floating, it wouldn't be too hard to just kind of like lay off the gas on paying towards the end so it wouldn't exile. Mm -hmm. Right. All um, right, then there's this package of parlay cards. <laughs> The so sn the snitch is good this as a payoff it was good i think it did yeah. consistently what it's supposed to do it did not do anything extra crazy in my opinion I, a little worried about this card looks like it does too much maybe for someone like alessandra it's just easy but in general i still needed to figure out a way to parlay an enemy that's right and i think the big thing with snitch is like if you don't have a parlay printed on an asset mm -hmm. in play, then Snitch is only as reliable as you getting a parlay event in hand and also having an enemy at your location, right? Which is why the card uh, draw was so important in the deck to, to get there. And the Bewitching That's helped right. that as well. Neat. Yeah. I, I really liked Bewitching. It's kind of funny to say that I, I like the card that like helped you fix your hand because I couldn't see your hand. Um, <laughs> True. But it still seemed like it was doing the exact thing that you wanted it to be doing. Uh, I love right this card the for the, the decision you have to make about do I take the card now or do I draw from my deck? And right. I decided after thinking about it that I really wanted to draw from my deck instead of from for, instead of getting the, uh, the the card from the attached thing so that's different from stick to the plan i don't know if that's the right decision all the time but i think it made the sense in this deck i think um i think there's something funny that might happen with uh decks that are using eldritch tongue with parlay mm -hmm. and bewitching because you'll be like rfging some of your parlay stuff uh yeah and so, like, you won't see it a second time. So you'll have to draw it off the Bewitching. That's true. Um, but I do still think that, like, the first enemy you see, if you've got if 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 you've got three cards attached and you haven't seen any of the copies of it yet, like, why why would you draw them off the Bewitching and not just search for it? Especially right? with this deck that doesn't actually need a immediate solution to the enemies. That's fair. Yeah. Like you don't a, you don't need to go find your breaking and entering so that you can investigate through and succeed by two. You right. Lord, can you imagine that card in this deck? <laughs> I'm imagining it. <laughs> yep, yep. Okay. Yeah. Well then we'll come to the elephant in the room, which is this silly persuasion card, which I think is fun. Is it the best card ever? No, but I consistently used it and, and beat the test. I don't think I ever failed a test on it. You never failed the test on it, and it also got us out of some, like, really sticky jams with the board state of, like, oh, there's a really nasty enemy that spawned away from us. I need to fight someone here. And you said, oh, it's fine. I'll just walk away and I'll persuade that guy to, to I'll, you know, it's the it's the Trailer Park Boys meme. I'll pay you $100 to fuck off, right? <laughs> and like, they had Doom on them, and that, you know, just got rid of that problem. Yeah, I know. It was like a big double whammy with it. And, you know, it, it it wouldn't have worked early in scenarios because you wouldn't have had the stats for it. That's right. right. And and but but that's just not that's not when it happened to be needed. Right. It was it was in high pressure moments a, a little while in where it was all of a sudden like, well, you know, I've got this I've got this persuasion in my hand. I, I can just get rid of this guy. Um. And it was particularly good for my weakness. Yes. Shuffling away a guy that we drew extra because of my weakness is like, it just saved, it saved so much pressure on those ridiculous turns where, you know, I draw my weakness during the upkeep phase and then we draw weak enemies during the mythos phase. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And yeah, I, he, I was I was really impressed with persuasion. I think it even happened with some aloof enemies. One thing I'm thinking a lot more about these days, I think there's a lot more aloof enemies in recent campaigns in Hemlock Vale for sure too. Yep. And this is just a solution without having to engage an enemy. And that you know, if you think about it with just pure action economy, a a, a fairly big enemy, even three health, right? That you can get out of play for one action rather than having to engage and then fight maybe twice is pretty big. That's right. Yeah. Now, I do think that shuffling it back into the encounter deck can be <laughs> not a permanent solution, right? Uh, but potentially with the team that doesn't care about drawing enemies that much, it could be better than a nasty treachery because it's replacing a future encounter draw. It's not, uh, you don't, I mean, you get it back potentially, but it's instead of something else. That's right. Yeah, you do draw it again, but you didn't draw treachery when you draw it again, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, maybe you're more well suited to, fit, to 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 deal with it next time. Um, shoving off a problem can be fine in this game. Yeah, uh, if it if it allows you to do things better this turn, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like, even just even just conceptually, if I can shove off this enemy so that we can win sooner. Maybe we don't even draw the enemy. That's right. Um, I did do it when there were three cards left in the deck once, though. <laughs> I mean, we did that just because it was it was it was it was what got us out of a jam, and yeah, we drew the guy right away, right? <laughs> I but, think I think I snitched off of it too. So, like you, you know, when you're adding get two clues to the card, it it, it sure is a lot better if you can yeah. keep your hand. Full. No, that's absolutely true. <laughs> it was just yeah. silly. I enjoy doing some silly things in this game, though, and uh, this I can see. Monterey Jack being extremely good if you play straight up what are all the best relics you could ever get. I mean, I didn't even take the Ancient Stones. I could have. But Eon Chart, um, I don't know, Pendant of the Queen, like there's lots of things that just feel strong for because they're strong everywhere. And he just gets more access to them and uh, can get them into play more easily. But also kind of fun to do something silly like this deck. That's right. Um, there's, I guess, I guess one thing we didn't mention in the in the main deck list mm -hmm. is the. Uh, I've I've closed your deck list like an income poop. One second, it, it, is is the sure gamble? Oh right. Uh, I know, it's a card I've not played a lot because you look at it and you think to yourself, this seems like a really expensive lucky. Um, but just like the scrying mirror, it lets you get away with so much. <laughs> minus five? Like you just How about plus five? Yeah. Yeah. The, the only time that it's like not that good is when you're like down by like one or two. Like it doesn't help you in some weird edge cases where you're down too much. Right. If you're even, you will always pass this test, except for on auto fail. Yeah. And you can figure that out with the scrying mirror or, you know, do other things, I suppose. Yeah. It's just an I, interesting I play the... pattern, right? I mean, it's like Lucky, but it's, you know, cost you some money, of course, but. But it turns, it turns that, <laughs> I, I thought it was actually hilarious at one point there, you you sure gambled just to see a bigger lucky cigarette case. Yeah, right. Uh, you pull you pull the minus five, and you're like, yeah, or a minus four maybe, and you were like, yeah, no. Rather than succeed by one, I'd like to succeed by nine. Um, <laughs> so let's just do that, right? I can afford two resources for that. I think that's really really interesting. Um, and I, I, I I'm 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 interested in playing that a bit more often in rogues myself. Yeah, I honestly um, have not played it outside of a parallel role in deck once and it was fun there because he could take insights one of the neat things about these parallel investigators or any investigator that gets something other than the zero five uh zero two of two classes is what are the level three cards that you can take that don't really fit into that class because they're not in that class and combining them uh not even level three i suppose even just the we talked about this once about the scrying mirror even the grotesque statue is kind of that way is in rogue those effects are magnified because you really do 
want to take gambles, but these are basically saying, oh, no, no, this is not actually a risk. Right. Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe Safina can, can do some of these tricks, but not all of them. And she doesn't have very good stats. <laughs> so what are some... What are some charms and relics outside of the this campaign play along pool that you think would be interesting on 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 monitoring check? Yeah, so besides like the strong ones, like Eon Chart, of course, just is good in him in either version of him, really. What yeah. else could you take uh, that might be fun? Well, a lot of things are relics. It's hard to sort of imagine that but uh you could throw in a runic axe with the checkbox there that's kind of neat but even better hunter's armor can be a relic as well that's right you can put eight eight check boxes into that one that can shore up some of the the health and sanity things but even getting more card draw off of uh taking damage or horror off of treachery yeah that seems huge i mean does it seem necessary? No, but it's certainly something interesting you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think this this deck as it is, obviously we did very well in this campaign. We got through some rough spots with some fancy play, but in general, <laughs> anything that you do that's different, you can just do something that's interesting in a different way. Um, what else is a relic? I mean, there, there's there's a lot of things, right? And and charms as well. You could do the the doom charms, maybe interesting with him. Yeah, the dowsing rod is is something that I was interested in because I was I was thinking to myself like moving around is kind of it, it's kind of funny because like you could you you could uh, you you could kind of like simulate the play pattern of the old Monterey mm -hmm. by shoving yourself around with dowsing rods <laughs> and like. You kind of already want to discover the last clue to clear the doom. That's true, right? Um, and then also, like the the Onyx Pentacle is 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 really good when you uh, are a, an investigator that can succeed by two or more. And he's already uh, got five base, so you get what plus one, and then plus two or three or something when you do the evade. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You you get a plus one to. Uh, to remove that doom if you succeed yeah if you succeed by two or more you can remove the doom but you also like it let the onyx pentacle lets you place the doom on it and, and evade enemies at connecting locations which is like really surprisingly good oh yeah uh, really it's really good i haven't found a good home for it because no uh no mystic has more than three agility that's right yeah i guess um lily i guess if you give her that discipline but still only level and, zero yeah yeah and what's funny about those doom charms is that like <laughs> if you do that um oh my god i just completely lost my train of thought nope that's that one's gone that was a lot gone forever it was a it's gone forever yeah yeah nothing else is like jumping to mind i'm sure someone has some crazy deck out there with everything you could put in in him um you know, you could do some healing with the uh, Hollowed Mirror. Level 3 you get even. The Blood Rites, I guess you could do that with the Occult Lexicon. I think that's a relic. Maybe not. That might not be one. Uh, the Dream Diary. Those are charms. Yep, Man, I don't think you charms. need the Dream Diary. <laughs> no, I mean, you're already testing at a silly value, right? Um, yeah. At one point, we had discussed uh, the Eyes of Volusia. Yes. Of asking, like... Do, is that the way we get the extra damage? Right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think for this deck in particular, the answer is no, because when it changes over, it becomes a hand slot. And I think it's a just, hand slot one way or another, right? Uh, I think it's a spell. Is it both? I think it's hand and arcane in, in both forms. Oh, yeah, it is. You're right. You're right. Well, that would be interesting in a three or four player game, maybe, if everyone else is doing a bunch of damage because it increases the skill value for everyone the first uh, on the first side. Yeah, and a bigger player count. That would that that could that could be made to make sense. Yeah. Uh I was wondering though about even the deck 
earlier in the campaign. I was like, is this just Finn Edwards, but a couple of purple cards? I'm like, well, maybe. Hmm. That's a funny way of putting it, but like, I th I think just no. Um, and and I was going to say because Finn is actually a fairly competent fighter, but I mean, you got the bullwhip. <laughs> yeah, so how much would it take to to get Monterey Jack up to fighting? Right, so he he gains the the rogue card pool right zero to three that he didn't have That's before. Right. So you it, with a full card pool, you could throw in you know. Even even uh, Lonnie, right? Could get you up to three, and then Delilah, maybe two versus three compared to uh, Finn isn't so different. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Dirty fighting. You can get the numbers up. That's right. I don't think you want to do that because you want to use the ability printed on the front side, but I, I think the, the ability again is really good. It's just not, in my mind, um, the strength of him. That sounds strange, but I think it's the deck building is is crazy, and the number the stat lines are so good that most of the game that's what you're playing, and every now and then you get to throw in uh, a free play action, mm -hmm. which is not like other investigators that you really want to trigger their ability as much as possible. Otherwise, you feel like you're uh, not really playing the character. That's right. Yeah, and and we we kind of talked about. How does this ability stack up against Monterey Jack's basic ability, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. At the end of your turn, if you start this round one location away from your current location, either gain a resource to draw a card. If you started the round two or more locations away, do both instead, right? We were saying for the amount of times that you are like searching your deck, which is like kind of a filtered card draw. Mm-hmm. And playing a card, which is kind of a play action, and reducing its cost by the shroud value, which is a kind of a bunch of resources, how does that stack up against how often you're getting a card and a resource from the, the front side of normal Jack? And I think we were both pretty convinced of saying, like, it's at least equivalent with the chance of being a lot better or a lot worse. Yep. The variance is definitely higher. Like, it seems like it's very much trading out the consistency for the, 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 you know, the, the, the high impact plays. Yeah. I might think about doing a regular front and then a parallel back and then kind of doing a big money build because you can maybe more consistently get the money from the regular front uh, and you could put well connected or something and get to level three, which you w otherwise wouldn't be able to do in the, original oh yeah form. Well, that's interesting i like that yeah I, I like that a lot actually that seems really cool yeah so that it is it's so i think it's so similar we the only difference about the the parallel front that can get you a lot more money is that elder sign which is nutty it was plus one resource for each charm or relic you have it didn't always hit but when it did yeah, the time the time that you grifted and pulled the elder sign and got like ten resources or something <laughs> ridiculous, like, oh my gosh, that was nuts. That yeah. was that was super cool. That was um, fun. so like you said, level three rogue cards, and I mean realistically, level one to three rogue cards mm -hmm. that that honorary Jack really just does not get access to normally. You know, there's a there's lot of weapons in level there. two. Yeah, pickpocketing level two, right? Yes. There's, there's, like you said, if you, if you, if you wanted to try and do some money stuff, there's, there's the high roller and the invest, and not investments, the the high roller and the well connected, mm -hmm. um, at that XP range. Uh, if you know, if you wanted to do gun stuff, there's technically the sharpshooter. Mm -hmm. Um, you can pick up a streetwise if you need stats instead of. Uh, stacking a bunch of a bunch of static boosts, you could have a streetwise in there. Uh, Black fan is is three XP, despite oh, the fact no. that it's, that's a relic too, and that's a relic as well. Um, oh man, I forgot that was a relic. Oh, yeah, this card pool is kind of cracked. Thieves kit level three. There's just there's just a lot of like really good rogue cards at that three XP level. I mean, there's a lot in, in one to two as well, um, mm -hmm. but it seems like there's an 
awful lot you can do with him that like missing out on level four or five rogue is not that big of a deal so when you compare uh the zero four relic to ursula right i Mm -hmm. think with the rogue cards you can do a lot more different things than ursula can do with the uh seeker card pool since it is so i don't know clue oriented i guess there's some interesting cards you can get for ursula i think there's more recently too but you know you wouldn't put uh enchanted blade for example into ursula but you could do it i don't i'm not sure it's a great idea but you could probably pull off either of the enchanted blades in monterey jack that's actually that's actually kind of a really funny thought to me uh because like you can just get a huge modifier with the mystic one. Mhm. You're you're probably not ever pulling off the horror healing and card draw from the from the guardian one, but like, you know, uh get, getting plus 4 and dealing yeah, get, getting plus 4 attack and dealing 3 damage for for two charges like if you're getting this into play for free, like why not? <laughs> well, here's the thing, right? If you aren't doing half your deck with some stupid parlay ideas like like I was, <laughs> you <laughs> you can just I, one of the dreams I think with the full card pool is you cycle through especially the hand slot uh relics or charms like no one's business. You say, "Well, I used up all of the charges on my enchanted blade. I'm going to discover the last clue somewhere and overwrite it with something else that's right yeah now in my opinion i don't think there's enough locations <laughs> in the game to make you do that that much but you could just take a play action no that's right that's right and i think that um kind of rolling back to those doom charms mm-hmm. um they, they they're well suited to being played over yeah they sure are um, you know why why get a succeed by two or more on the onyx pentacle if you can just play it over and with the amount of card draw you can pick up in in rogue you can see those things again and again and again do you think you could play him true solo um i don't know i think uh yeah actually yes but 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 not uh Not not as a result of his relic access, but just because he's got a really good gun now. Yeah. Um, with the 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 bulldog. Hmm. Yes, the British bulldog, bulldog is uh, the bulldog's really good. <laughs> That's true. And At he... least the upgraded one. Um, I think the upgraded one to me kind of gets into that same idea of the 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 the. the uh... Sorry, the 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 upgraded Derringer in Survivor there were like the the first one's like good, it's fine, but the upgraded one is like really strong. Once you get plus two on top of that, on, on top of changing it to agility, it's it's really not. Max, you're you're um, hitting at seven. Yeah. Yeah. No, shooting at seven with that British Bulldog is nuts. Yeah. Um, and it would be really funny to just like slot that into this deck. With with the parlay stuff in it, right? Like. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be really interesting to like kind of retool what you've done with the full card pool and see if you can make it work in solo. I don't know. I don't know if it would, but you could probably could. Um, and if you did, you could uh, reconsider which uh, mask you're using because you don't necessarily have to use the rogue one, right? They're all charms. That's true. I did like the rogue one for what I was doing. Yep. No, I think that's 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 fair. But the the mouse one could give you the willpower. The Cat one could give you the willpower and the combat, so it's it's you could you could do the doom charms with that one. Jeez, man. Oh, that's that's funny. Oh, you know what? That's what my train of thought was that I lost. Oh, good. We got doing back. the doing the cat mask with the charms. Not that I mean, not that the again, not that the willpower and the combat is particularly useful in him, but like you could take you know you give it a go. You could try it with the ceremonial sickle. Uh, it might be funny. Probably wouldn't. <laughs> And the the one willpower, I feel like, yeah, most of the time it's just a um, a horror like thing that you can probably deal with with any number of cards. You could take the cherished keepsakes, right? Those are charms too. That's right. Yeah. Um, but you can get around that with rogue in general. Now you can pass those tests with well connected if you wanted. That's right. Yeah. yeah. What I I just think he's a, he's so 
multi-dimensional. It's I'm kind of blown away by how much he could do even in just this limited card pool. Yeah, uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, it, you know, when I read it the first time, I was like, yeah, zero to three, and then also some relics. You know, it it doesn't seem like a lot, but it really is. So um, I need to stop playing rogues because I, I just look at this and I say, look, there's so many cards that do different things that you can make it work. Um, <laughs> and I, I can't say the same thing about other classes right now. Survivor, you can't. I think Survivor, you can do it too. But you get so shoehorned into particular um, sets of cards, I think, in the other classes because they really want you to deal with enemies in a particular way or they want you to get clues in a particular way, whatever way that might be. The rogue seems to have a bunch of different ways to do the different things the game asks you to do. So getting clues with enemies around is kind of what this deck wanted to do, but you could just investigate with Thieves' Kit. You could do, I don't know, all kinds of other things. And The card draw to me is just so phenomenal that you'll you'll find all the pieces. Right, yeah. And and you're doing it in a way that like doesn't feel so... Um... I hate to say the word degenerate, but like you're you're not doing it in a way that feels like you're busting the game open. You're just you're just playing some assets that draw you cards, right? Mm -hmm. And and search cards for you, and you have to do something impressive to be able to pull that off. We were talking about Trish and putting Bewitching and Astounding Revelation. <laughs> you could do that here too. He can take five level zero secret cards. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Astounding Revelation, um, you know, there's. I'm, I'm certain that there's some there's some cards in this card pool. Uh, maybe not. Sorry, not the CPA card pool, but in the in the Charm and Relic realm that use secrets, right? So that it's not just a bunch of money for Astounding Revelations. It's 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 extra extra uses. You know, it uses secrets. Uh, don't say the Ancient Stone, please. <laughs> it, it is, but I was going to say the Scrying Mirror, but okay. <laughs> 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 yeah no replacing replacing the stuff on the scrying here is actually like super cool um, uh, you're right agent stone no well yeah I, I, and honestly that's kind of how i felt about this uh deck and the uh, and hank too like i don't think we were busting the game at all i think it was they were good and i felt a little bit like okay maybe i can do more than I really should be able to do, but also there's 63 XP in here. So what do you expect? That's right. Um, I think that I think that that like full clear of Threads of Fate really set up us set us up on a really strong trajectory for the rest of the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, especially after like the first one was kind of fumbled a little bit. Um, I will say that like overall, I was really impressed with this Monterey Jack deck just because like. It seemed like it had a lot of tension being pulled in several directions, um, like like you mentioned a couple times here, right? Like the trying to go in on both this relic thing and also trying to like pull off this parlay thing. Like it 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 didn't really seem like it was actually struggling to pull those off. Like there were a few times where maybe you had too many of your parlay things in your opening hand and you couldn't make use of them. Yep. Yeah. But like you just kind of were like, well, I mean, yeah. You know, sometimes you get a bad draw and you've just got to draw through until you find the thing you're looking for. Um, it was it was really cool seeing something like that because when I've tried that kind of thing in the past, like, uh, you know, uh, a Leo Anderson big gun deck that also tries to play into, into him having lots of allies, mm. right? Uh, you've got so many ammo cards and you've got so many big guns because you need to see them. And then you've got all these allies and I'm like, fuck, it's so hard to to get all this in the deck and feel like my deck is able to do anything uh, aside from just see allies and play guns and <laughs> refill guns, right? Um, but it's neat to see someone, like another character kind of do something like that where you're, you've got these, you, these two split things you're trying to do and actually following through on it and, and doing it well. That's a really good point. I need to feel like I write a, I need to, Feel like I feel like I need to write a, an essay or a video about this because I usually tr go in to deck building thinking about like what are my two archetypes and they're not always uh, at odds with each other. I think these were completely separate, um, but 
Yeah, like when is that a good idea and when is that a trap? That's right. Yeah. I don't know yeah, if I no, have an I answer. That is a really cool concept to explore. Yeah, I don't have an um, answer for that right now. I mean, I immediately had that idea with the deck just because of the the card pool uh given to us but it's a really interesting question of if it's worth pulling it off or not and yeah it worked out i'm a little surprised myself yeah um i think another example that i can think of is i played a what was it a finn not finn sorry a min forced learning that's why i said finn by accident <laughs> just a spoon reason with that uh, a forced learning min with short supply and so like the deck had a scavenging item thing and uh, a high skill count thing and then also an improvised thing mm. and like it didn't really do any of those three things particularly well but it did all of them like just competently enough for us to be winning scenarios um and i think that this is like on the opposite spectrum of that we're like no this was actually pretty consistently crushing uh even though it was being pulled into really disparate uh disparate um directions i wonder if there are some relics that would play into the parlay a little bit more i know there's the eyes of Lucia, but that wouldn't really help with the snitch um since it's no that's a, right yeah not a successful parlay but there might be something out there i don't know but I gotta think about that. I'm, I'm. I guess we're gonna wrap this up now. But I, I'm very intrigued about how to write up such a discussion. So, thank you for for bringing that up. Yeah, no problem. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> after an hour and twenty minutes of talking about these these decks, I had a great time. I think this was just a, a blast to play with someone else and 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 to explore the card pool. Maybe stretch our, our deck building imaginations a little bit in in different directions. Sometimes I, I get I get it that some. Uh, times the limited card pool doesn't let certain cards shine because you need more to that package i think um right. but in i think in in tfa which had persuasion in it <laughs> uh coupled with the the parlay stuff from hemlock Vale, it maybe worked out pretty well yeah and, no, and that's right and for hank i think all of those spirits from nathaniel cho also helps out oh. really well yeah those those did a good job of, of of kind of rounding that out yeah cool all right well that is it for us after eight or more scenarios and several months of play uh but we had a good time i hope you enjoyed and learned something about these uh these decks or investigators along with us so until next time i'll see you later bye